Jonathan Edwards is considered by many, if not most, to be the greatest theologian born on American soil. Even though he lived long ago, he lived during colonial times before our country was actually a nation, America has yet to produce a greater theologian than Jonathan Edwards. One of his biographers wrote these words about Edwards, giving us insight into his greatness, why he was so great. He writes, considering, considered the towering figure in American colonial church history, arguably the greatest pastor, preacher, philosopher, theologian, and author America has ever produced. Edwards lived with an enlarged desire to experience personal godliness. In his pursuit, he became a model of discipline, worthy of our emulation. In other words, he's saying that it was Edward's personal discipline in the pursuit of godliness that played such a large role in his life. So disciplined was this man that at the age of 18 and carried over into 19, he wrote 70 purpose statements for his life. They're known as his resolutions. Unlike our New Year's resolutions, which we all know honestly tend to fall away after a few weeks, just falls by the side, Edwards constantly reviewed his life in light of these 70 resolutions. In fact, he was so conscientious in scrutinizing his life that he set aside some time each night to explore his soul. He wanted to determine as he closed each day whether or not he had been negligent in obeying God's word during that day. I'm familiar with Jonathan Edwards' resolutions, and I can tell you that one of the major themes that runs through them is his determination to use his God-given time wisely. Steve Lawson, in his book, The Unwavering Resolve of Jonathan Edwards, if you don't have that, you should. It is a marvelous book. The Unwavering Resolve of Jonathan Edwards. He writes this about Edwards' diligence to make the most use of his, his time on earth in light of eternity. Now, I want you to know some of these words are spoken in the first person, and they're taken directly from Edwards' resolution. So Lawson has combined his words with Edwards' words. He said, it's clear that use of time was vitally important to Edwards because he positioned resolutions on this matter early in his list. His aim was to rise early, work late, and fill every moment with constructive activity. Edwards pledged never to lose one moment of time, purposing to not give way to listlessness, which relaxes, he said, my mind from being fully and fixedly set on religion. Edwards was motivated to use his time well because he had a strong realization that he, that, that he stood each moment on the brink of eternity. He deliberately chose to think about the common circumstances which attended death. He determined to live as he would in the hour before I should hear the last trump. And as he would judge proper when I come into the future world, he aimed to live without regrets. Supposing I live to old age. To promote this perspective, he resolved to imagine how he would live had he already seen the happiness of heaven and hell torments. Now, the reason I'm telling you all of this about Jonathan Edwards and his resolve to live with eternity in mind is because we happen to be studying a psalm whose message is that the only thing that really matters in life is that we live with eternity in mind. And that psalm, of course, is Psalm 90. So I invite you to turn to Psalm 90. Now, last week we began to look at this psalm. We began to look at Psalm 90 and we discovered that it was written by Moses, but it was written during a time when the children of Israel were wandering about aimlessly in the wilderness. They, they would be doing this for close to 40 years. It was God's punishment upon them 
for their unbelief and their rebellion because initially they refused to enter the land of Canaan that God promised to them and settle there. It was just unbelief. God said, I'll take care of, of the people. I'll drive them out. They, out of fear, rejected this. And so God judged them by causing them to live like nomads, just wandering around, having no permanent dwelling, moving from here to there, going in circles, being directionless for 40 years. And it's in the midst, folks, of these aimless wanderings by the children of Israel with no permanent dwelling, as I said, of their own, that Moses writes this psalm, the only psalm attributed to him in Scripture, in which he exhorts his fellow Israelites, note this, to make God their dwelling place. You have no physical dwelling place. I'm writing to you that God might be your dwelling place spiritually. And so verse 1 opens the psalm by saying, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Now, this first verse of the psalm, it is the key to understanding the rest of this psalm. It is the key that unlocks the message of this psalm because in this first statement, Moses is telling his fellow wanderers uh, that there is a permanent place for them to dwell. There is a place for them to rest their, their weary souls. Now that place of rest is not physical piece of land. It's not the, the land of Canaan yet. They'd have to wait until the 40 years were over for that. But what Moses is telling them is that they can now find rest in their hearts even as they wander about the wilderness and they can find rest in their hearts by dwelling in God. Just as some of their forefathers did. In every generation, there have been some individuals who have dwelt in God and what Moses is exhorting them to do and by way of application us is to dwell in God now, to be the people of this generation who dwell in God. And what, what he means by all this about dwelling in God is that they can take refuge in him by trusting him, trusting him to be their protector, their caregiver, their security, their, their shield, their defender. He's the one who will always be there for them in times of trouble. Now, as I told you last week, although this psalm is probably the oldest portion of Scripture, it's certainly the oldest psalm, its message couldn't be more up to date. It is contemporary, it is relevant, it is modern, because its message is that there is nothing more important in this world than being in a right relationship with God. Nothing more important. In the language of the New Testament, that means not only trusting Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior, but it also means abiding in Him as our friend, as our Lord, our Master, as we fellowship with Jesus by meditating on His Word, by speaking to Him in prayer. Jesus spoke about abiding in Him. He used this terminology, abide would mean to dwell in Him. He said in John 15, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. He means nothing of any value. Now, this is the, the same message that Moses gave to the Israelites about 3,500 years ago. And because it is God's word, it is living. And so it is God's word for us today. God wants you to dwell in Him. God wants you to look to Him as the most important one in your life. He wants you to trust Him as you go through life, this journey of the wilderness that we're in called this world. But listen closely, because what Moses does in this psalm is not only tell us that we should make God our dwelling place, but he actually argues for this. He argues that we should make God our dwelling place. And he does this by laying out a logical case by presenting us with certain realities, certain truths certain realities about life. He gives us three of these realities, and the first one being this, and we saw this last week, but I, I want to review and then move up to where we are, and I want to also camp at some places and press home some application. 
First reality is God is eternal. And we can say this, only God is eternal. Verse 2, before the mountains were born or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now what Moses is telling us in these words is that God is eternal. He has no beginning. He has no end. He existed before he created the mountains and the earth and even the entire universe He was there, and he will continue to always exist. He is everlasting. The reason Moses is telling us about God's eternality is to press home his case that only God is is worth living for. He's the only one worth dwelling in because only the eternal God is a suitable place for any of us to dwell. Only the eternal God has always been there and will always be there. And only he offers eternal security for us. He's the only one we can count on because you know what? He's not going anywhere. And he doesn't change in his nature. He's the only one we can have confidence in, the only one we can truly depend upon. He is that immovable rock that we can anchor our souls to. And what makes Moses' argument so compelling is that not only is God eternal, but He goes on to tell us in a second reality that man's days on earth are so limited. He tells us that man's life is transitory. Notice verses 3 through 6. He says, you, you turn man back into dust. And you say, return, O children, to me for a thousand years in your sight or like yesterday when it passes by. Or as a watch in the night, you've swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep. In the morning, they're like grass which sprouts anew. In the morning, it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening, it fades and withers away. Now, what Moses is saying in these verses is that unlike God, who is everlasting, man's life is very brief. God returns him to the dust from which he came By sweeping away his life as powerful floodwaters sweep away everything in sight. We're alive for only really a fleeting moment. Just like he says the grass in the desert, it sprouts in the morning. Only to fade and wither away by evening. The sun just scorches it. It's just just up for a little while and then it's gone. And the reason for this reality of death after such a brief life is because of God's judgment on sin. He tells us in the next few verses, 7 through 11, for we have been, meaning we Israelites, we've been consumed by your anger and by your wrath. We've been dismayed. You've placed our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days have declined in your fury. We have, we have finished our years like a sigh. <coughs> As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years or due to strength. 80 years, yet their pride's but labor and sorrow, for soon it's gone and we fly away. Who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you? Now, I'm not going to take the time to review all these verses in detail because we really studied them last night, and they're all pretty much saying the same thing. Moses is telling us that in the older generation of Israelites, they were dying off in the wilderness, just as God said. They were dying off. Corpses would have been laying around. They would never enter the promised land. And they were doing so. They were experiencing death because of God's judgment on them. Their sin was against God and God judged them because they refused to trust him and obey him. Now, it's also, we have to keep in mind, in light of the Bible's overall message, the the reason that death is even a reality In the human experience is because, as we saw last week, the sin of of Adam. Adam's sin brought the arrival of death. Death entered the world, entered the human realm because of the sin of Adam. And God counted Adam's sin against us as well because he was the head of our race. And we would have done the same thing. We were in, if we were there, we were in Adam. Now listen closely, because the point that Moses is making and telling us about the brevity of our lives is that in light of God being eternal, everlasting, and our lives being so short, we need to make sure that we live with eternal values in mind. And that's why we need to dwell in him. 
this eternal God. Now we know this is the point that Moses is making because of what he tells us in verse 12. So, this is the application. So, here's what you do, he's saying, in light of this. So, teach us, God, to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. The thought is that we might gain a heart of wisdom. In light of the fact that our days on earth are so few, Moses asked God to teach us to consider how little time we really have left so that we can gain a heart of wisdom. In other words, if we would just stop and give some thought about the brevity of our lives, that'll help us to realize that we should spend the rest of our days wisely. And what does it mean to live wisely? What does it mean to have a heart of wisdom? Well, it means to make sure that the eternal God is your dwelling place. That's the point. That he's the one you're living for. He's the one you're trusting in. He's the one you are honoring during your brief sojourn in this world. So Moses is asking the Lord to teach us to number our days. The question is, how do we do that? Practically speaking, how do we do that? Do we actually count <clears throat> our days? Well, no, it's not by checking off each day and then subtracting it from 70 years to figure out how much time you have left. That's, that's not what he's saying. No, what Moses is calling us to do is to recognize that time is short and we need to make each day count for God. That's, that's the point. So, before we move on to our next section of the psalm, I want us to give some serious consideration to what Moses is saying and how to apply this to our lives. So how do we learn to number our days? How do we, how do we actually gain a, a sense of, of time that time is so short, time is fleeting away, and, and that with such limited time that we, we do have left, we need to live for the Lord? How do we actually do this? Well, here's how it starts. It starts with actually believing what the Word of God says. Taking it seriously. What scripture says about the brevity of life. Taking it to, to heart. Pondering this. Uh, not just coming here, leaving and then going to lunch and never thinking about this again. It means not being foolish enough to think that you have all the time left in the world. Listen to what scripture says concerning how momentary our lives really are and, and how wrong and actually dangerous it is to ignore this reality. First of all, we have a strong warning from James, the letter of James, James chapter 4, starting at verse 13. He says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we'll go to such and such a city and spend a year there, engage in business, make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. He says, all such boasting is evil. Now, it's important to understand that James is, is not condemning these people for making plans. We all should make plans. That's wise living. But what James is condemning these people for is making plans without God. Leaving God out of the equation. In other words, these people just left God out of their plans. They, they had come up with a strategy for making money. They would move to another city, spend a, a year there, engage in business, make a, a profit, and that was that. That's all. I've got my, my one-year plan. I'm going to do it. But what they never considered, what never entered their minds, is that they might not even live to see tomorrow because of the transitory nature of a man's life. Which is why James compares our lives to a, a vapor. He means either a puff of smoke or perhaps one's breath on a cold day. It just appears for a moment and then, and then it's gone. You don't see it again. James says that's what your life is, is like as far as God is concerned. So it never dawned on these people that God might end their lives before they were able to make all of this money that they thought they would make. Now, folks, those who refuse to count their days are like these people, foolishly making plans for the future, but leaving God out of those plans. 
And never giving a, a moment's thought to the brevity of life that they, there might not even be a tomorrow. Listen, don't be foolish like these people. Your life, my life, will be over before we know it. So think about your days being numbered by God. And then make sure that the Lord is the center of your plans and that everything you plan to do is done with the Lord's honor in mind. Scripture says, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, even if it's just eating and drinking, all the mundane things of life, do it to the glory of God. Jonathan Edwards, who I mentioned earlier, he did, he had a strategy. He had a game plan for making sure that everything he did was done with a conscious awareness that his life on earth was so very brief. So whatever he did, he felt it must be done with eternity in mind. The following is resolution number seven. I told you there were 70. This is number seven from Jonathan Edwards. He said, resolved never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. Let me read that again because that's brilliant. Resolved. And I might add, this is coming from an 18-year-old. Maybe 19. No, the seventh one would have been 18. Resolved never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if it were, if it were the last hour of my life. Edwards evaluated every activity that he did by considering, considering if he would do this activity if he knew this was the last hour of his life. Now, folks, that'll sanctify you. That'll purify you quickly. In other words, he kept his mind on eternity by focusing on the hour of his death, not in a morbid way, but in a realistic way. And in doing this, it helped him to weigh the importance of everything, especially material possessions. I say that because he wrote these words down in his diary. His diary was different than his resolutions. Here's what he wrote in his diary. I'm not sure what year it is, but it says Monday, February 3rd. He he lived about, let's say, 1722 or so. This would have been about that era. Monday, February 3rd. Let everything have the value now which it will have upon a sickbed. And frequently, in my pursuits of whatever kind, let this question come into my mind. How much shall I value this upon my deathbed? In other words, he lived his life by numbering his days and asking himself what would really be of value to him when he came to his last day on earth. Now that is a sobering question. I, and as I told you before and reminded you, I remind you again that Jonathan Edwards wrote these words and these resolutions when he was just a teenager. And yet at such a young age, this man applied to his life exactly what Moses is talking about in Psalm 90. Teach us to number our days that we might present to you a heart of wisdom. And God gave him a heart of wisdom. He gave Jonathan Edwards that heart of wisdom. And he'll give it to you too if you will number your days by seeing how little time you actually have left so that you live each day to the glory of God. And remind yourself of this. Another passage of scripture that drives this truth home, the brevity of life, is in Luke chapter 12. Our Lord told the parable that speaks of the truth that our time on earth is extremely limited. And none of us knows when that time will end for us. Therefore, it is sheer foolishness, nonsense, to leave God out of our lives while we pursue riches for ourselves. Notice what Jesus said about a rich man who only wanted to accumulate more riches. In Luke chapter 12, starting at verse 16, Jesus said, He told them a parable saying the land of a rich man was very productive and he began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I'll do. So here's his strategy. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones and there I'll store all my grain and my goods and I'll say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your soul is required of you. And now, who will own what you've prepared? So, here was a man, 
And God called him a fool. You never want to be called a fool by God. Here's a man God called a fool who never stopped to consider how brief his life really was. And so he didn't know how to live and he didn't know how to die. You don't want to be called a fool by by God. You don't want to ever hear that. You, You want to hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, not you fool. So do what Moses says. Number your days that you may gain a heart of wisdom. If you have to, write it down. Put it on the refrigerator. That each day you're going to consider this might be my last day on earth. That'll teach you to trust Christ, not only as your Savior, but to live each day in the light of his lordship over your life. So here's this just practical suggestion as to how to, how you can obey this principle of numbering your days. Make a determined effort to live each day as if it were your last. Think about it. As I said, maybe write it down. Upon waking up each morning, get into the habit of thinking about this, that this might be your last day on earth. And then ask yourself questions like these. If this is to be my last day, then how shall I live today? How close will my fellowship be to the Lord? How will this affect my obedience to the word of God, my my values, my attitudes, how I look at possessions, how I speak to people, how I treat people, what I think about. Once again, Steve Lawson writing about Jonathan Edwards in his resolution said this, focusing upon the end of life had the effect of helping Edwards prioritize what was most important in his life. This perspective restrained his sinful thoughts, activities, and words. Further, it helped him choose the highest ends in life. Not all choices in the use of his time were between good and evil. Some of the most difficult choices were between good, better, and best. Always living as if he were at the end of his life caused him to live for what is best The glory of God. That is what is best, always. Now, going back to Psalm 90, we see that Moses has told us two very sobering realities to try to persuade us that we need to make sure God is our dwelling place, that he's our place of trust, uh, that he's our refuge. Number one, he said, God is eternal. He's the only one suitable to trust because he is that unmovable rock which you can always count upon. People are never dependable. And nothing else is dependable. Everything is unpredictable except the Lord. So dwell in him. Secondly, man's life is transitory. Our lives are just so very brief. And death is inevitable. Therefore, while we live, we must live for the glory of God of this majestic, eternal, everlasting God. Who invites us graciously to dwell in him. But listen closely, the truth of the matter is that none of us have lived this way, at least not consistently. Looking back at our lives, we, we all have regrets. Regrets for times that we sinned against the Lord. Regrets for times that we sinned against other people. Regrets for times that we were very selfish and self-absorbed. Regrets for time that we wasted doing insignificant things that had no bearing on eternity. We're we're just meaningless. So what can you do if you have regrets for the way you've lived in the past? You you obviously can't go back in the past and change things. So what can you do? (laughs) Well, you know what? Moses is going to tell us what we can do. What we can do if our lives are filled with regrets and disappointments for the wasted years. He does this by giving us a third reality to persuade us to make God our dwelling place. Having told us that God is eternal and that man is transitory, Moses now tells us that for those who dwell in God, he makes their lives meaningful. For those who dwell in him, God makes their lives meaningful. Verses 13 through 15. Do return, O Lord, how long will it be? And be sorry for your servants. So satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness that we may sing for joy and be glad all of our days. Make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us 
and the years we have seen evil. Now, listen, the only way to understand these verses, these words that Moses wrote, this prayer of Moses is to understand and remind yourself of the circumstances under which Moses wrote these words. It was when the children of Israel were wandering about in the wilderness. They endured great hardship. The chastening hand of God was heavy upon them, roaming around, no direction, no scheme of things. And for how many years at this point when the psalm was written, I I don't know. But it must have been many years. Maybe it was at the end of, I assume it might have been at the end of the 40-year trial. There was death all around them, corpses around them, sorrows, harsh living conditions. So what Moses is asking the Lord to do is to turn away his wrath from them. To show them his love and compassion. How? By returning grace to them. By removing his chastening hand. So that the few remaining days they did have left on earth, that it might be filled with joy and with gladness. In fact, if you look at verse 15, he specifically asked the Lord to give them as many days of gladness as he has given them of pain and affliction. Now listen closely. What Moses is asking the Lord to do is to remove his discipline from them, to bring it to an end, and finally lead them into the promised land, the place he had had given to them many years ago. In other words, Moses is asking God to just end the 40 years of discipline (coughs) by setting his love upon the Jewish people once again, causing them to sing for joy as they would experience the goodness of God in the promised land. That's why Moses says in verse 16, let your work appear to your servants and your majesty to their children. What is he asking here? He's asking God to work in their midst, listen to this, like he used to by once again demonstrating his majesty and power to them and to their children as he brings them into their inheritance in the promised land. They hadn't seen his majesty. They hadn't seen his presence for about 40 years. They had seen much of it as he demonstrated his power in bringing them out of Egypt. You remember all the plagues he, he did upon the, the Egyptians and how the sea dried up and Parted. That's what they're wanting to see again. They haven't seen this for years. Demonstrate your majesty. Demonstrate your power once again as you bring us into the land. Now listen very closely because here's something that's critical to understand what Moses is doing. Although he doesn't use the word repentance, which means a forsaking of sin, a change of mind, what he's doing here in his prayer to the Lord, he's actually expressing... A cry of repentance on behalf of the Jewish people. See, in asking God to return his grace and compassion to them, what he's saying is that we want to return to you. Return to us because we're returning to you. In other words, they want to dwell in him spiritually even as they dwell in the land of Israel physically. Bring us to the land, Lord. We repent of our sin. And the evidence that they want to dwell in God is that they want to experience his loving kindness, Moses said. So they can sing with joy. Not just a happy song, but he means sing with joy to to the Lord. They want to see his work. Uh, They want to see his majesty as he displays his power once again in bringing them into the land. Listen, there were a lot of people who lived in the land of Canaan. God would have to, if he settled them in the land, display his power. There were Canaanites all over the place. There were still the giants there. That's what he's talking about. Overcoming all the obstacles, all the challenges that that were there and caused them to initially shrink back in fear. Lord, let us see your power in overcoming this. We're ready. So what Moses is saying to the Lord is that they're just ready now to dwell in, in him. They're ready to walk in fellowship with him. They're ready to trust him. They're ready to let him be their refuge, their protector. They're ready to once again experience his love and his power. They're ready to see his majesty like they once did so many years before, prior to departing from Egypt. So, what about us? We don't have a special piece of land on earth that's been promised 
to us. But if we are repentant over the wasted years, all those days we spent on ourselves ignoring this majestic, everlasting God as we lived in rebellion and disregard of Him. If we are repentant and we're ready to dwell in fellowship with God, then the Lord will do for us what He did for those who were repentant during the days of Moses. And what did He do for them? He made their few remaining days and years on earth meaningful, valuable, eternally significant. Moses tells us about this in the next verse, which is the closing verse of this psalm. Verse 17, let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and confirm for us the work of our hands. Yes, confirm the work of our hands. Now, what is this about? Well, actually, this is the crescendo. This is the peak. This is the highest point. It's the summit of this magnificent psalm. It's where everything's been leading. Because what Moses is saying is that when one repents of their sin and makes God their dwelling place, then the Lord blesses them. That's what it means to to show favor upon us. He blesses them by making the work of their hands meaningful and something that will be lasting and enduring. I I say that because this Hebrew word that is translated in, in my English version, confirm, sometimes it may say establish, that Hebrew word also has the thought of permanence. Permanence in the sense of lasting significance. That is to say, when God blesses the life of someone who is repentant, a believer who is obedient to him, one of the things that he does for us is he takes our works and he makes them count for eternity. Regardless of how much you've wasted in the past, from this point on, what you do will count for glory. See, when you dwell in God by abiding in Jesus Christ, fellowshipping with Him, taking in His Word, speaking to Him throughout the day, trusting Him, resting in Him, your life will take on new meaning. So that whatever you do, it has lasting value. Jesus called it bearing fruit. It has lasting value because you are doing these things now with God's glory in mind, regardless of how small your deed might be. Listen, these works that Moses is talking about, these works that God will confirm and and, and give permanent value to, we're not talking about necessarily the big things in life. There are very few big things in life. We're not talking about colossal works, not major things, but Usually those mundane, small things in life that that often go unnoticed by everybody else but the Lord. Remember, Jesus said that even a cup of cold water that was given to one of his servants would be rewarded by him. Just a cup of cold water, that's all. Folks, this is the kind of wise heart we gain when we number our days because those who know their time is short, and life is brief, will use their time wisely. They will redeem the time by investing their lives in the things that really count, the things that have eternal value. What's that? People in relation to the Word of God. Only two things will last, people and the Word of God. Invest your life in whatever your vocation is. Invest your life in people in terms of having an impact on them in light of the Word of God. When you are walking in fellowship with Jesus Christ, dwelling in Him, you will find that even the smallest, most ordinary things that you do will take on new meaning because you will now do these things, these mundane tasks for the Lord. And that's what gives them eternal and enduring value because your works will be for God's glory now, not for your own. So don't fret over the years that you have wasted by living for yourself. If you know Christ, all of that's forgiven anyway. In the remaining days you have left, and nobody knows how many days we have left, make sure that your heart is right with the Lord. Make sure that you have repented of all known sin. Make sure that the Lord is your dwelling place, your trust in Him, that He's your priority. He's your security. He's the one who has dominion over your life. And he will make your life and all the works that go with your life meaningful.
But you should be very concerned if in your soul you have not yet trusted Christ as your Savior. You should be very concerned if you have never turned to Christ to save you. You should be concerned because life is brief. And like the man who pursued riches and built barns to store his increase, God may say to you, sooner than you think, you fool, today your soul is required of you. So don't delay. Come to Christ today while you still have time. You may not have tomorrow. Trust Christ's death for your salvation. Place your faith in Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, to be the only thing that's sufficient for the forgiveness of sins. Repent of your sin. Cast yourself upon the mercy of God to save you. Let's bow for prayer. If you have never trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, I urge you to do so now, today. Turn to Him. Don't be a fool thinking you have all the time in the world. You have today. You have right now. If God has shown you your sin your need for salvation, because he's holy, he'll punish sin. If he has shown you your need for salvation and that he has punished sin in the person of Jesus Christ, then turn to Christ, trust him, give him your life. For those of you who know Christ as Savior, make sure you're abiding in him. Make sure you're living every day as it it is your last, because it may very well be. Father, we thank you for this magnificent psalm We thank you for teaching us, for reminding us, Lord, of these great truths. So, we say with Moses, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. I pray you'll remind everyone here that this might be their last day. And may that be a habit for everyone here that starting tomorrow we think about this. And the next day, and the next day, until it is ingrained in us. Help us to evaluate everything, our possessions, what we consider important in light of the fact that this might be the last hour of our lives. And I pray, Lord, for those who have never trusted you. I pray you'll impress upon them how serious, how dangerous it is in light of eternity that they have not yet trusted Christ, that they may indeed have their life cut short at any moment. So I pray that you will open their hearts to Christ And may they see the urgency of the hour to turn to him for salvation. All of this, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you for coming. We'll see you tonight at 6. You're dismissed. 